couple weeks later, Ryan actually sent me this message from Vegas. I got caught up after the show and made a hasty decision with a girl, as you know. But it's very obvious I am not with my soulmate here. If you'd like to see if there could be still something, we should talk. I just had a soft spot for him, and I felt like even if we weren't going to have a relationship, I cared about him, and I wanted to help him. The Playboy Murders on ID is a six-part series, and each part focuses on a different murder case, and in some way that case was connected to the Playboy world, whether there was a playmate involved or a bunny involved. When I first heard of the idea for the Playboy murders, the producers showed me the cases they were thinking about covering, and they were cases that I had never heard of, and that really surprised me because I thought I knew everything about Playboy's history and about what happened to all the playmates and things like that. And that really intrigued me, and I really saw that as a show that I would love to watch. So I was really excited about these stories, and I was really excited to bring more attention to these stories and that was something that really appealed to me. And it made me wonder if they were buried in any way. So that's always, you know, a bad feeling and it makes you want to help tell these stories for the people that aren't around to tell them anymore. I think when people think of Playboy or Playmates, they just think of like beautiful women and just very one-dimensional, you know, sex symbols, but these are real people and they live real lives and sometimes tragic things happen and I think real human stories should be told. at the mansion, I felt safe in a lot of ways because you're living in this big house, you know, behind a private gate with security. But sometimes, and I've learned this through the stories we're covering, sometimes that can be like a false sense of security for some of the women who are involved because then after having all this exposure, they just go back to their normal lives where they don't have that security and they don't have that protection. And that can be a big adjustment sometimes, especially when fans and people who buy the magazines, sometimes there's people out there with, you know, different ideas about what their accessibility should be. The story of Stacy Arthur sticks with me the most just because, you know, she was in such a positive relationship with her husband and he was so incredibly supportive of her and they were both so, you know, ambitious and hardworking and this tragedy just tore all that apart. I was really surprised to learn about the 1-900 number. Um, that took place about 10 or 15 years before I was involved with Playboy and to me it was kind of surprising. It kind of seemed like something that didn't really align with what I understood the Playmate brand to be. It seemed a little accessible or too accessible, especially during a time period where a 1-900 number was thought of generally as like a sex line. That didn't really seem appropriate to me. It seemed like it was giving people a little too much access, especially since these women were making the calls from their own homes. So I was really surprised to learn about that. These are definitely really important cautionary tales for people who might want to go after fame or exposure. Because I think from the outside, you look at famous people and you think they all must have money and be really well taken care of and not have a care in the world. But that's not true. You know, fame doesn't necessarily guarantee you money or security or safety. And there's a lot of downside that comes with it, so I think it's important that people know that. So after the elimination ceremony, he got back to his hotel and he started calling me over and over and over again. And I mean, I was getting ready to fly to Mexico to film the finale 
and I had the producers with me. I could not talk to him on the phone. And then I was planning on calling him and explaining everything to him, smoothing it all over, and we could just go on with our happy plans. And two days later, he called me, and before I got to explain to him what happened, he said, I have met the love of my life and I'm married. I really could not believe it because just two days before that, he told me he was gonna marry me and I was the love of his life. One of the really tragic things about Jasmine Fiore's story is, you know, she was somebody who by all accounts was in love and this attack came from the person who was closest to her and, you know, they were wrapped up in like some fame and drugs and fast lifestyle and things like that. And it's really scary when you know, your murderer could be your partner. She went to the Orange County Coroner's office for an autopsy. We need to start trying to identify this female. We can't do prints, and her face was too badly beaten to really try to make a positive identification in any way. But uh, we had a sketch artist come in. And we put the sketch in the media to see if anybody could recognize her. The killer thought that they had done everything they needed to do to conceal the death and or the identity of the person they killed, but they forgot one item. During the autopsy, they removed her breast implants. Every prosthetic, including breast implants, have serial numbers on it. Her name was Jasmine Fuel. Jasmine was uh, 28 years old. We learned that she was a former Playboy model. I'm Jasmine, have a good time. When I lived at the mansion for seven years, um, that involved some very dark times for me. And because I experienced those things, it makes me feel like I can resonate with these stories a little bit. And it really makes me want to share these real people's stories, especially since many of these people aren't around to share the stories themselves. And maybe some of the stories didn't get as much press attention as they should have in the beginning. And I think it's really important to tell these stories, you know, just from a human standpoint. What viewers can take away from some of these stories is sometimes when you get a little bit of time in the limelight or a little bit of fame, a lot of negativity can come with that. And I think from the outside, people don't see that. Like when I would see people on TV growing up, I thought they just had it made. And like, if you're famous, you're automatically rich and you're automatically protected and you're automatically safe. And that's not the case at all for so many people. And I think that's important to know. I think fame isn't necessarily the most desirable thing as some people think it might be. So even though it's like a, it's like a photo studio that we've dropped in on, you've been in the middle of a shoot and then the kind of the idea is we've pulled you away just to talk to us about the series, but we're trying to keep that vintage Playboy look that we've had throughout. So a lot of the, we're trying to make everything, as you know, like look like a Playboy club. Yeah, I like the that. chair, it adds like a nice texture to it. Yeah, that's what we're going for. I think I realized there was a dark side to Playboy probably like after, you know, my first night out with the group or right when I moved in, but I wanted it to be better. And I wanted, you know, when you're young, you feel like, okay, well, this is just like, I have to, be a hard worker and I have to, you know, make it in the world or do what I have to do. But, you know, as time went on, you know, over the years, you just kind of realize where the actual problems lie. I feel like all this backstory that's coming out about the Playboy world is really surprising to a lot of people. And the Playboy murders definitely expands on that and goes into so many people's real lives after they left the company and what happened to them after, you know, posing and things like that. The first TV show I ever did was a reality show where I was presented as being a certain way, but that wasn't me at all. It was just like all these edited clips to make me look completely different. So being behind the scenes on a show that's about facts and real stories and that's very sympathetic toward the victims is really rewarding to me because I love telling real stories and I love being a part of that. Just the most important thing to me with all the cases is just that we handle it as respectfully as possible and not do anything, you know, gratuitous or, you know, we just want to be respectful and keep like the victim's families in mind as well. No, absolutely. Yeah, no, we'll keep that in mind. I'm sad. I actually brought a photocopy of the original Playboy Bunny handbook, the one that Carol would have been given. So some of the rules are pretty interesting. Can I have a look? Go over those, yeah. This is bad even for the... 
I know, even for the stuff they're willing to put in print, right? There's no way that Hef and Playboy weren't aware of all these stories just because they did, I know that they did collect, you know, all the media and the press clippings and anything ever mentioned having to do with the brand. But of course they weren't focused on because they weren't positive stories, but I think they're important stories to tell because they're real stories and these people aren't around to tell their stories anymore. And sometimes there's takeaways and things to be learned from these horrible things that could really happen to anybody. We're living in a time where everyone has a voice now, whether it's through social media or just expanding media in general. And we can hear the stories of real people who maybe didn't get that attention before because maybe the powers that be didn't want these stories out, or maybe, you know, they weren't thought of as something that was important in the news cycle at the time. Now we're in a time where people want to hear everybody's story. You know, people want to hear the truth. Three words I would use to describe the Playboy murders on ID are shocking, compelling, and surprisingly real, because these are all real people. You know, they're just like you and me. These kind of things could happen to anyone. And there's just something so compelling and engaging about that. People should watch the Playboy murders because these are real stories about real people who sadly aren't around to tell their own story anymore. And I feel like so many of these stories didn't get the attention that they deserve. And I feel like there's something we can learn from these stories because these things could happen to anybody. I think Playboy appealed to women for so many reasons. You know, for me personally, I saw it as a stepping stone to Hollywood. I saw it as a thing I could do that would make me feel beautiful and glamorous and something I could do that would be exciting and fun and, you know, something to do while I was young. And I think, you know, to like a small town girl, it can look like a rite of passage or, you know, you see some of the people who were playmates who then went on to be really famous or successful. So. I think it's almost like wanting to be in a pageant or something like that. For me, the best part of being affiliated with Playboy is just the female friendships I've taken away from it. And those people that I'm still talking to 20 years later, I think that's a really positive thing I've taken from my experience. I mean, one of my best friends who I do a podcast with today is Bridget, who lived at the mansion with me 20 years ago. We're still friends and we're still reconnecting with all these women we knew back then. And you know, 20 years later, it's like, we never stop talking.